Hi, everyone. So in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about some basics about taxonomy for entomology. And taxonomy is basically the science of naming things and also the science of putting smaller groupings into larger groupings. So in the last lecture, we had talked about the phylum arthropoda, and that basically translates to jointed legs. So these are going to be invertebrates that have body armor in the form of an exoskeleton and jointed legs. And by and large, this is the largest phylum of animals in terms of species diversity. Most animals on this planet are going to be arthropods and belong to that phylum arthropoda. Now, we had also talked about in the last lecture how you can divide the phylum arthropoda into five subphylums. The first of those subphylums is actually extinct. That is the subphylum of the trilobites. The second of those subphylums are going to be the chelicerata, and the chelicerata are going to include your scorpions, your spiders, your ticks, and those things. Moving on, you have the subphylum of the myriopodes. So myriopodes means many-legged or million-legged, and that'll be your millipedes and centipedes. And then you'll have two subphyla that are actually very closely related. So often so that they've actually been suggested to actually be one subphylum, but here I'm treating them as separate. The subphylum crustacea, which is your shrimps, your crabs, your lobsters, and the subphylum hexapoda. Now, crustacea are almost entirely going to be aquatic, except for those roly-polies or isopods, and hexapods are going to be entirely terrestrial. And so, like I said, recent sort of evolutionary biology studies suggest that they are very closely related. We're going to pretty much just focus on the subphylum hexapoda. Hex refers to the fact that these organisms have six legs. So that's where you get the hexapoda as the Latin translation. And we talked about in the last lecture how they also have three body parts. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Those are the three body parts of the hexapoda. Now hexapods can actually be divided into two smaller groupings that are known as classes. You have the class ectognatha, which means outside jaws, and the class entognatha. So like I said, you have these smaller groupings that are part of larger groupings, and that's really the power of taxonomy. You can make these progressively more specific groups. So the ectognatha are your insects, and the entognatha are your non-insect hexapods. And for the sake of this class, you can actually collect both of them. So you can collect both things that are traditionally identified as insects and things that are the non-insect hexapods. But I don't want any spiders, I don't want any scorpions, I don't want any centipedes or millipedes. Those are in different subphyla. So the entognatha are the non-insect hexapods, and they are entirely apterous. A is usually Latin for without, and teres refers to wings. There are three orders within the entognatha. So now we're getting to orders, which is an even smaller, more specific grouping within class. The first of these orders are going to be the Calembola, and then the Diplura, and then the Protura. And these things are all, by and large, small, soil-dwelling, usually only a couple of millimeters or even smaller than a couple of millimeters. The most common one that you're going to run into are the springtails, and that's going to be the common name for those that belong to the order Columbula. Like I said, these are going to be small. They kind of look like what I've drawn there, but there are other ones which are a little bit more sort of stout and sturdy, which you'll see me draw in this next segment. You might be wondering where you actually go ahead and find these, and there's actually tons and tons of columbolins in those malaise trap samples that I've given you. Now, columbolins should be stored in alcohol. They're too small to pin, and because they're kind of soft-bodied and squishy, if you try to point mount them, they dry and shrivel up. So columbolins and also diplurins and proturins, they go in alcohol. 
Now, moving into class in secta, you have two subclasses. Again, smaller divisions. You have the apterigoda and the terigoda. So these are two taxonomic divisions. Apterigoda means they do not have wings, and terigoda means they do have wings. The apterigoda are the more primitive insects. They're wingless. You might think that they are entognatha, but they are actually ectognatha. They have their mouth parts largely on the outside, and there are about two orders of the apterigoda. You have the archaeognatha and the zygentoma. The pterygoda is going to be the much larger assemblage of insects, and that's going to have many more orders. They have about 26 or so, depending on who you ask. So recently, some orders have been collapsed into, you know, sort of larger orders. But for the sake of this course, I largely keep them separate so that you have a better chance of getting more orders. This is a good time to talk about your collection grade and the math and some suggestions on how to collect. So each unique order that you collect is worth 3% of your total collection grade. So orders would be things like Hymenoptera, Archaeognatha, Coleoptera, Diptera. Within the orders, you have many families. Each unique family is worth 2%. So you're obviously going to collect many of an order. You're going to collect many coleoptera. But the trick is to collect many different families. And sort of at a beginning level, the best way you can ensure that is to collect different looking things that don't seem similar. So as an example, you're going to collect many different examples of hymenoptera. That's going to be the order that contains the ants, the bees, and the wasps. So what I'm drawing here is a bumblebee, which of course belongs to the order Hymenoptera, and it specifically belongs to the family Apidae. If something ends in D-A-E, it's a family. You get 3% for your first Hymenoptera, and then 2% for the family Apidae. Now here's another example of another Hymenoptera that you're likely to collect. Remember, Hymenoptera is an order, it's one of the big groupings, so you're going to collect many of them. So this belongs to the order Hymenoptera, and it belongs to the family Formicidae. So now this is a new family, and Formicidae, by the way, are all the ants. All ants belong to the same family, Formicidae, so you don't need to collect a lot of ants, you really only need to collect one. You don't get another 3% for Hymenoptera, you've already done that, but you do get another 2% for Formicidae. My point here is that there is no point in collecting a ton of ants, or a ton of bumblebees, or a ton of honeybees. It's wasteful. Collect many different families. Now, there is a hierarchy of orders that are easy to collect and hard to collect. So I'm not going to list all 26 to 29 orders of insects because some of them you, you frankly do not find in the northeastern United States. But the ones that I've seen in almost every student collection since I've started teaching this class three years ago is that almost every student is going to have a bunch of coleoptera, which are the beetles, a bunch of diptera, which are flies, a bunch of hymenoptera, which are your ants, bees, and wasps, a ton of hemiptera, which are bugs, a lot of orthoptera, which are your crickets, your katydids, and grasshoppers, especially if you're collecting in that field behind Farmingdale. Everyone is going to have some lepidoptera, which are the moths and butterflies. And then some things are not impossible to collect, but they're also a little bit harder. So the isoptera, which are the termites, we found some of those on our first collecting trip by kicking over some rotting logs in the forest. Blatodia and Mantodia, by the way, these three orders, Isoptera, Blatodia, and Mantodia, are sometimes grouped together, but for the sake of this class, I do consider them separate orders. These are a little bit harder to find, but not at all uncommon. Odonata aren't difficult to see out in the wild, but they are just kind of crafty animals that are hard to capture. Then you have the Ephemeroptera and the Neuroptera. So these do appear in student collections. In fact, you will probably have a few of these things that are in sort of this middle column, as well as Dermaptera. They're just not as easy as the stuff that's under the easier section. The Archaeognatha 
and the zygentoma, sometimes called the physonura. Those are your bristletails and silverfish. Those are a little bit harder just because they're not flying around. Thysinoptera are the thrips. You can find them in greenhouses in the soil, but they're just very tiny. Siphonaptera are easy if you happen to have a cat or dog. Those are the fleas, but a little bit hard otherwise. Mecoptera are the scorpion flies. I gave an example of that in my last video on anatomy. Trichoptera are going to be your caddis flies, and these are going to be somewhat harder to collect, especially since they're much more common during the height of the summer and not really this fall period that we're in now. And then you have the insects that I consider challenge mode. Now, I haven't had a student collect a Strepsiptera, but I have found them before in my malaise trap samples, and you can often find them embedded in wasps because they're parasites. The Socodia are the lice and lice, like human lice, head lice, pubic lice, those are kind of hard to collect, but their close relatives, the book lice, are actually very numerous in the malaise trap samples. So you can actually get one of these challenge mode orders. Now to be clear, challenge mode orders aren't any extra points, they're just harder to find. Phasmatodia are the stick bugs. I've had a student turn in one or two of them over the past couple of years from Long Island. And Mbioptera are the web spinners. They're just very tiny and students tend to overlook them. So this is sort of my guide. And like I said, you are getting 3% for every single unique order. So if you get 10 orders of insects, so you get many of those easy ones and a couple of the more difficult ones, you are already at 30% of the 100% you eventually want to get to. So do 100 minus 30, that's 70 points that you still need to account for. So 70 divided by 2, because each unique family counts for 2%, that means that you have to get 35 unique families. So it's hard to answer how many insects do I need for this collection because it's not about the number of insects, it's about the diversity that you collect. But remember this math, 3% for each unique order, that means it's only counted once, and 2% for each unique family. So if you collect more order diversity, you don't need to have as much family level diversity, but if you only collect, you know, five or six of those easy orders, you're going to need to have a lot more families and a lot more insects to get that diversity. Okay, so that's pretty much all I have about taxonomy and sort of the math of your collection.